Okay, let's go and get started today. And today we're gonna to do a little bit more with uh, movement of object uh, around on the screen and add a little bit more of a, uh, another layer to that to make things more realistic. And so in order to do that, first off, let's uh, do a quick review. All right, first review here is radians. So radians are a much more mathematically natural way to measure angles than are degrees. Degrees are this arbitrary number that somebody picked a long time ago and they said, you know, if we're going to divide up a circle, let's divide it up into units of 360 uh, equal sized units all the way around the circle. And there are some reasons for doing that. Uh, 360 is nicely defined by, or divided by 2, divided by 4, divided by 10, divided by 5, uh, divided by 3. So there are reasons for doing uh, 360. Uh, same reason there's 36 inches uh, in a yard. Same reason there's 12 inches in a foot. Uh, it's divided by a lot of different things. So there's some niceties to that. You can divide uh, a circle with 360 degrees. You can divide it into quarters and fifths and tenths and sixths and thirds and halves and all of those, and it divides equally. But it's not the mathematically a mathematically natural way to do that. And so what radians are is we just assume a circle with a radius of 1. So here's uh, a radius of 1. Let me pick up something that's a circle. So here's the circle. We assume that that has a radius of one. And so with that circle having a radius of one, we say, okay, well, if I walk around the outside edge, then how far around I walk is gonna represent the degree I'm at from where I started. So in other words, I could walk a quarter away around the circle, halfway around the circle, uh, a 10th of the way around the circle, three quarters, all the way around, whatever. But the idea is how far have we walked? And if we track the angle as how far we've walked around that circle, that describes a degree. And so how, how far is halfway around? Well, we know that pi is the same uh, ratio for every circle. And with pi being the same ratio of every circle, well, if this is a radius of one, the diameter is two, so it's two pi all the way around. So halfway around is one pi. And that's true not in an arbitrary way. That's true no matter if we are humans or an alien race or uh, uh, let's say that all society collapses and it needs to get recreated, that would be the same because it's based on pi, which uh, that ratio is not arbitrary. It's something that's a universal uh, constant that exists everywhere in the entire universe, no matter what circle we have. So that radians become the natural way to measure uh, angles. Now, as a quick review of that, uh, here's zero is the same as 360. So if we walk all the way around to two pi, then we are at zero. Two pi is back where we started again. So the angle there would be the same as 360 degrees. But here I have this uh, diagram that has some other ones on it. For example, there's pi, which is 180. Also minus pi, if we walk this way, we'd get to that 180. And then uh, the same thing is true for this. 30 degrees is pi over six negative pi over 6, or 11 pi over 6 would be over here, down here. Same, uh, but minus 30 degrees. And so you'll notice that the this uh, on this chart that there are 180 degrees for every pi radians. So you can actually perform any of those conversions. One degree is pi over 180 radians, or that number of radians. And one radian is 180 over pi degrees, or 57 point, roughly 57.3 uh, degrees. So we can convert back and forth between the two, but so in, in human terms, I think it's easier for us to think of in degrees, but for something that's more mathematically natural and universal radians, uh, it's helpful to understand those because that's what the math libraries uh, we're gonna be using use. All right, a quick review of sine and cosine. So sine and cosine basically says, hey, as we're walking around that circle, let's treat that as a triangle, that this creates a triangle here. And so sine is the distance above the, uh, the axis. And cosine is the distance over on the axis so that that point is at that angle. So in other words, you can see if we chart that and start at zero, the sine, the distance above, will increase as we walk up to the top of that circle. And then it will start back down until we're back at zero. So that would be over here somewhere. And cosine starts out being all the way over, since this is a circle with radius of one, all the way over at one. And as we walk, we get closer and closer and closer to the axis until we hit it. And if we keep walking, then we start getting farther away from it again 
until we're at negative one all the way over here, as far away from it as we're ever going to get. And as we walk, we start walking back towards it again. So sine and cosine are really just sine is how far we are up and down uh, above the line. Cosine is how far to the left and right we are. And again, those assume a radius of one. Now, in our problem that we had last time, we essentially used those and said if we have the angle and we have the length of the uh, vector here, in this case, think of it as the hypotenuse of this triangle, we don't have a radius of one right now. We have a radius of, in this case, ball speed or the speed that the object is moving. So how do we compute the two legs of the triangle, the dx and dy? Well, dy is up and down, so that's going to be sine, and dx is left and right, so that's going to be cosine. So essentially we take the speed and multiply it by what sine and cosine gave. And the reason that sine and cosine, uh, we have to do this multiplication of those, is because sine and cosine give the value as if it were a triangle of length one. So now we need to either scale it up or down based on whatever the speed is, and we can do that by multiplying it. So that's essentially scaling the triangle up or down using similar triangles to match the hypotenuse that in this case would be speed. All right, so now we have this uh, way of, hey, if we're given the speed and given the angle, how do we compute the displacements? We know how to do that. But now we're up to what we want to cover tonight, which is something new. And that is with, uh, what if we want to bounce off the walls? So if we have something that bounces, it's going to need to change the dx and dy. So for example, if we have uh, a, let's say, a, here, let me have something that show, looks like a wall. Let's say this is the wall, and this is the ball that's moving, and the ball is coming in, and it wants to hit that wall and bounce off. And let me actually switch over to the document camera and draw a little picture of this so you can get a sense of what I'm talking about here. So let me, uh, give me one second. Okay, so here's uh, the document camera. So in this case, we want to say, all right, what happens when something bounces off of the, uh, the actual wall. So here's a ball, and let's say it's moving like this. So notice that it has, if we look at that, I don't know if you can see that or not. Hey, let me draw that a little bigger. So here's the ball, and let's say it's moving like this. So it has a dx that's the uh, left and right of that, so I'm going to label that. That's dx, and it also has a dy or I could draw that over here as well, dy. So what happens if that ball collides with a wall? Well, we know that we want it to bounce off with the same angle that it came in. Well, if you think about that, uh, it bouncing off at the same angle that it came in, here, is it, here it is coming in. We want it to bounce off. Now that's going to create a ball that has a new direction. In other words, this angle here needs to be changed because now the angle is going in a different direction. It's going in a different direction entirely when it bounces off. And the angle it's going in this particular case, if this is zero, so this is zero degrees over here, then notice the angle it's going at now has changed. So I'll call this angle prime. So notice that new angle now is going to be different than the angle we had when we started. Now, how can we figure that out? Well, the easiest way to do that is going to be to say, well, if it hits a vertical wall like this, then the dx is just changed. So notice the dy is the same. So in other words, here's dy here. Here's dy again. dy, in this case, for both of these, has remained the same. It's continued to move down because it didn't hit anything in that direction. But you'll notice that the dx in this case, dx, is now going in the opposite direction. It's going that way instead of that way. So in other words, it was going this way, and now it's going that way. So the dx is now going to be negative dx. So in other words, we just whenever we hit a, horse or a vertical wall like this, we just invert the dx, and then we need to just compute, hey, what's the new angle with that new dx? So what we're going to need is we're going to need a way to convert from the dx 
dy back to the new angle. And in this case, notice the speed isn't going to change. The speed is kind of this hypotenuse here. That can stay the same. Although we could, if we wanted to, we could make it so every time there's a collision, we lose a little bit of energy in the collision. Uh, we have an inelastic collision and the speed gets a little smaller too. So we can make the speed smaller, invert dx, compute the new angle, and now we would have a ball that like in a pool table it hits the rail and it loses a little bit of energy and slows down a little bit every time it hits that. We could also lose some energy every time we move it uh, due to friction. But you'll notice that our, our thing right now is going to be to invert dx when we hit a horizontal wall, or a vertical wall I mean, and then compute the new angle and then store that back into the angle variable. Now what happens if I hit a horizontal wall? Well, that's going to be the same thing, but we just turn this this way, and this is going to become dy. That's going to become negative dy, and dx's are going to be the same. So in other words, it's the same problem. It's just which one do I invert? Do I invert dx when I hit a vertical wall? Do I invert dy when I hit a horizontal wall? And we could even do this. What happens if I hit a slanted wall? Uh, that's a little bit more complicated. We'll worry about that later. But for right now, let's just focus on getting this thing to bounce. And the key to this is going to be figuring out if something changes the dx and dy, how can I compute a new speed and a new angle because of that? All right, so let's switch back to the presentation. Okay, so the idea of what we're going to want here is going to be computing the angle and the speed given dx and dy. So this is the same problem we just solved, but it's kind of solving it in the opposite direction. In this case, we have dx and dy, and we want to know what the speed, what speed and angle those represent. Okay, so how do we do that? How, given the two sides of this triangle, knowing it's a right triangle, how do we compute this angle, and how do we compute that speed? Okay, let's start off with finding the speed. So finding the speed is actually probably the easier of the two, and to find that speed, the first thing that you need to do is think about this as a triangle. So in other words, we have this bottom leg, we have this side leg of this right triangle. How do we get the hypotenuse? To do that, we just use the Pythagorean theorem. And if you remember the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, or c squared equals a squared plus b squared. So in this case, speed squared is going to be equal dx squared plus dy squared. So the hypotenuse squared is going to be square of this leg, square of that leg, added together. Or if we solve that for the speed, the hypotenuse, we just take the square root of both sides, which leaves us the square root of dx squared plus dy squared. So now our speed becomes, if we were to look at this in Python terms, dx squared plus dy squared, and then we're raising to the 1 half power, the 0 0.5 power to do the square root. So speed is going to be equal to that. All right, so that gives us the length of this. That gives us the speed given a dx and dy. Now, how do we get the angle? Now, to get the angle, one of the things you might remember is uh, there are a couple ways we could do that. We could use uh, arc tangent, we could use arc sine, we could use arc cosine, but let's take a quick look at uh, what we're talking about there. So we know that the sine of this angle is going to be equal to dy divided by the speed. And again, uh, sine of angle with a radius of one would just be dy. So in other words, we can cover this part up. But since it has this hypotenuse, we need to scale this back down to the uh, a scale of 1. So we're going to divide by speed. So just like we multiplied by speed to scale that to the size that we wanted earlier, using similar triangles, we're now using similar triangles to divide that back out to get back down to a radius of 1. So to get this down to a radius of 1, we just divide dy by speed, and that was going to be equal to the sine of that angle. Now. If we want to solve for angle, we just take the inverse sine or arc sine, and that's going to give us angle equal arc sine dy divided by speed. Now, that seems like a good uh, solution, except there's one problem, and that's that dy divided by speed, the thing that's going to go inside of this arc sine, gives the same value in two places on this circle. And you'll notice that I've kind of diagrammed that down here. So right there, that's the same point is right there. In other words, dy is the same in both of these, and since the speed hasn't changed, or the hypotenuse hasn't changed here and there, we don't. We have to know which one of these we're talking about, because that's a different angle. This angle here would be something like, I don't know, what's that, like 40 degrees. And then this one over here is going to be 180 
minus 40, so about 140 degrees. So those are different angles uh, in each of those cases. So we need to be able to distinguish those, and we can't look at, in this case, because dy divided by speed is the same in both of these, at both of these angles. So how do we figure that out? Well, there's a couple ways to do that. Uh, the, since those are the same in both places, the one way that we can look at is look at the dx. So if dx is greater than or equal to zero, or you know we're on this side, if dx is, uh, or not greater than, equal to, greater than, or if dy is less than zero, we know we're on the neg, or dx is less than, not, we're on the negative side. So in other words, we're gonna look at dx, and if dx is positive, we're on this side. If dx is negative, we're on this side. All right, so to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to say dy over speed is that's going to be the same. We're using that in this arc sign. But we're going to do look at dx. So if dx is greater than 0, we use 0 plus arc sign of that. So 0 plus gets us to there. Otherwise, if dx is negative, we do 180 minus that to get up to there. Now, it turns out that there is an easier way to do this uh, than what we're doing there. And that easier way is there's a function that does all that for us built into it. And this is part of the math module, uh, not just in Python, but pretty much any uh, math library in any programming language you'll encounter. And that is this arctangent2 function. And the way the arctangent2 function, or atan2, works is you pass in the dy and the dx, and it just gives us the angle. So, but inside this function, it's really just doing that arc sine doing the check for us uh, on dx, and then doing that calculation for us. So we could do it ourselves, but for convenience, since this is already created and already works, we'll just use that. And again, most programming languages have that function available, so that's a, uh, if you're going to do game programming, that's a useful function to know, because I always just say, hey, here's one side of the triangle, here's the other side of the triangle, tell me what the angle is. So we don't have to divide by speed. We don't have to do any of that stuff. It does all it for us. We just say, here's the side of a triangle. Here's the other side. This is the Y side. Here's the X side. It tells us what angle we're talking about. All right. So an overview of how to use that, uh, all pulled together in some, with some Python code. So DX to, uh, and DY is what we're given. How do we compute the angle and the speed? Speed, we use Pythagorean theorem. And I'm going to fix this and take out the capitals of the stupid word processor added in automatically. All right, so speed is dx squared plus dy squared raised to the 0 0.5, or the square root of that, Pythagorean theorem. And the angle is math at a tan 2 dy dx. Now, that's not quite the final code that we're going to use here. There's one other thing uh, that I want to uh, quickly point out here. And that is, uh, and actually, let me fix this diagram. This dx is in the wrong place. I don't know why that's way over there. OK. So and that is the math module uses radians. So right now, notice the angle that's being returned here is going to be in radians, because that's what atan2 returned. The second thing to remember is that this is mathematically correct, but the y-axis in pi game is upside down. It grows going down rather than up in normal Cartesian coordinates. So we're going to have to account for that. So to pull all this together uh, with both of the types of conversion, the first type there, given angle and speed, how do we get dx and dy? Well, dx is speed times math dot cosine, because cosine is left and right, math dot radians of that angle. And this is assuming that the angle is in degrees. We convert it to radians, we feed it to cosine, we take that, multiply it by speed, that gives us the displacement in x. Now, for dy, it's the same thing, except we have sine, which gives us the up and down portion of that triangle. And not only is that sine giving us the up and down, but it's in an inverted coordinate system, so that's why we multiply the dy times negative 1 here. Now, to go the other way, to convert dx and dy into angle and speed, well, we use Pythagorean theorem. Again, the stupid word processor, oops, decided that I needed to capitalize my code here. All right, so Pythagorean theorem for the speed and for angle, we do math.atan2. Notice the negative sign in front of dy here because we're inverting the coordinate system back that we inverted up here. dy dx, 
that gives us a number of radians, which we convert back into degrees and put back into the angle that this thing is traveling. Okay, so these two things now give us this fluid way of converting. If we have some movement vector, we can say, all right, here's my vector at this angle, the speed at this angle, what are the displacements? Or if I do something like collide with something that modifies the displacements, I can then convert that back into what the angle and speed would result from that. So I can fluidly go back and forth between the two things, and that's gonna be a really powerful thing for us. So now we're gonna write some code. Uh, we're gonna go back to that ball bouncing code where the ball bounces off the wall. Uh, last time, remember, we made it wrap around. Uh, so maybe we'll start with that code where it wraps around and then we're gonna add some things to that. And notice that in this case, uh, when the ball hits, it's a vertical wall, meaning one that's going up and down. We just want to invert the DX. So DX is going this way. And the thing bounces, we invert it, and then we're going to convert back to uh, the new angle and speed that it's going. When the ball hits a horizontal wall, in other words, one that's like this, whether it's the top or the bottom, we're going to invert dy. So if it comes down like this, we flip dy, so now it's going back up the other way. Convert that back into a new angle and a new speed. All right, so let's write that. Uh, and I'm going to switch away from this to the actual Python interpreter. And we're actually going to write some code. Let me see. I believe I have the code from last time already up. But I uh, let so let's go and start with that. Let's review that first. So let me switch over to the code uh, first here, so you can see it. And let me move this so we can get it all on the screen. Okay. Put that there. Okay, so here's the code that we had from before. So let's quickly go through this and look at where we left off. And then we're going to add the new bouncing uh, behavior to this. So the first thing we had is we initialize pi game or import pi game, import math, import the random number uh, module. And I don't even think, I don't know if we're using random right now or not. Uh, I don't think we are. So I'm going to go and take that out since that doesn't really seem particularly useful to what we're demonstrating here right now. All right, so looking at this code, we initialize pi game, we create the display surface, 800 by 600. We create our variables for the ball. It's gonna start at 400, 300, which is right in the center of our 800 by 600 screen. We set its speed to 0 0.5, we set its angle at 10. And that angle of 10, remember zero is going directly to the right, and 10 is 10 degrees kind of in an upward direction. So if we were to measure that angle, that's gonna be 10 degrees. Now we enter our game loop. The game loop basically, let me scroll down a little bit. The game loop essentially pumps the event queue, gets the keys. It's if the escape key is pressed, it breaks out of there. If, oh, we are using random here to set a random angle. Let me add that back in. I forgot why we were doing that. And notice when we press space, it picks a new random angle. If I press A, I can change the angle in the positive direction. If I press D, I can change the angle in the negative direction. So it allows us to kind of rotate the thing one way or the other. And now for the calculation part. So here's the part where we calculated the displacements. Here's the part where we applied the displacements. And now here's the part where it wrapped this uh, ball around the edges of the screen. And then after all of that is done, we basically just uh, if they press escape and we exit this, we do pygame.display.quit. Now, down here after we do all that, the rendering part, we clear the screen to black. We draw the ball at its position, ball X, ball Y, and then we update the display. Now, let's go ahead and run this and just remind ourselves what it did. Okay, let me move this so it's all on the screen. So there it is, and notice it's at that 10 degrees, kind of traveling in this upward uh, and to the right direction. And remember we press, could uh, press space to randomly pick a new direction. Or we could use the keys A to add to the angle, D to subtract from the angle, which kind of lets us drive this thing around. Okay, and notice it wrapping around. Now we're gonna change this so rather than wrapping around, we're gonna have it bounce off the edges. All right, so let's do that. 
So in order to do that, let's go back to the code. All right, so here we are back to the code. So the big part about this is the part that made it wrap around was down here. So we're gonna change this and we're gonna make this bounce. So we're gonna say bounce ball off the screen edges. So in other words, if the ball gets to be greater than 799, then here's where I wanna invert DX. So I'm gonna say DX equal minus DX. Or there's another way we could do this as well, and that's, if you remember that times equal thing, times equal negative one, that's going to move the ball uh, in this inverse uh, direction. It's going to reverse that. Now, one other thing that I want to add here is if it does hit the edge, I want to put it right on the edge too. So I'm going to say ball underscore x equal 799. So in other words, if it's greater than 799, it should, shouldn't have passed the edge, so we put it right on the edge, and then we invert dx. Now, let's do the same thing for ball x of 0. So here... If it gets to be less than zero, then set ball x equal to zero. And now we want to invert dx. So here, dx. In this case, we're going to do the same thing, times equal negative one, which basically just inverts it. So if it has a positive number, it'll become negative of that same number. If it has a negative number, it'll become positive. Now, let's do the same thing for dy. So if uh, ball y is ever greater than 599, then set ball y equal to 599. And then here, set dy oops, times equal negative 1. And if ball y is ever less than 0, then ball y equals 0. And dy times equal negative one. So now we have this thing where it's going to invert those. But one of the things we did, we need to do is before we wrap back around to the loop again, to do this stuff again, I now, if I've changed the dx or dy, that will create a new angle. So I need to compute that new angle. So down here, below these if statements, just in case the um, a change from dx and dy, we need to recompute the angle. And for completeness, I'm gonna go ahead and put speed here too. All right, so to recompute those, I'm gonna say uh, we had that ball underscore speed. Let's do that one first. We said that one was the easier one, so we just used Pythagorean theorem. So here we're doing the square root and what are we doing the square root of? We're doing the square root of dx squared. So dx squared plus dy squared. Square root of that. So that's the speed. Now the angle. So there's my angle variable. Same one we used up here. We're now going to recompute that after dx and dy might have changed. So in this case, the angle, we're going to use math.a tan 2 of dy. But remember, that had been inverted to put it on the screen. So we need to do negative dy, and we need to do dx. And there's one other thing we need to do. This returns radians, but we are storing this in degrees. So we need to do math.degrees of that whole thing. All right, so there are the two parts uh, that we talked about. In other words, up here, calculating the displacements from the speed and the angle, and then if the displacements change down here, we now have the option of computing them back. Now, this is a little bit non-optimal because we are always computing the speed and the angle back, even when there was no collision. We'll fix that in a second. Let's make sure this, uh, oops, this actually works. So let me go back to the Python code, and let's run this. So there it is running, and notice it bounces off the edge. Oh, let me move that down so we can see both edges. Now, something happened there. We're stuck at the top. Let's see if we can figure out why. So bugs will happen. 
Oh, and I see the problem. We needed to do a times equal there. We had a typo where we left something off. Let's try again. And bugs will happen as you're programming things, uh, no matter how careful you are. So just be ready for that. That's why we kind of build up programs a little bit at a time. Now it bounces off the top, bounces there. And notice this will work at other angles too. So let's pick a new random angle. It'll still be natural there. It'll also work if I do this. <laughs> so I'm just holding down the A key where I'm constantly changing the angle and constantly driving into the wall and bouncing off at the same angle. Okay, I stopped that. But you'll notice that this actually, uh, if I have it so it's going straight up and down, it'll keep bouncing straight up and down. If I put it so it's going straight left and right, it'll bounce left and right. If I put it at some kind of shallow angle, it'll bounce off correctly. Put it at a steep angle, it'll bounce off at that steep angle. And so this works. And one of the things I said was that there's a way to make that code uh, maybe just a little bit better in that right now we're converting from speed and angle to dx and dy back to speed and angle. And we're doing that over and over and over again. Now, there's one way that, there are a couple ways that we could fix this. One would be only storing the, store the ball dx and ball dy as a vector. That would be useful. Or the other way to do this is only do the computation back to a new speed uh, and angle when we hit something. Let's solve it that way. So the way I'm going to do this is like this. So here's where I detect the collision. So what I'm going to do is before that, I'm going to say ball collided. I'm going to say equal false. And then what I'm going to do is if I ever do collide, I'm going to set that variable to true. So where do I where did it collide? Well, it collided there. It collided here. It collided there. And it collided there. So notice this is a little more code, but now it's going to run more efficiently because the only time we're ever going to recompute these things down here we're going to put this in an if statement. So I'm going to say if ball collided is true. So if we did collide, we could have just said if ball collided there. Then, and let me move these over. Then we recompute back the other way. So if we had a collision, then we recompute the new speed and angle from dx. And notice that's not going to really have any impact on our uh, behavior, but it's more efficient now than it was before. In other words, we're not computing things unnecessarily. We're only computing them when we need to. And you notice our speed is pretty slow now. Notice this will also work if we ramp the speed up. Let me add a couple of keys here to make this thing so we can control the speed. So let me do a up here. Let's say if keys. Let's make it so we have like a gas pedal. So K or a speed increase here. K underscore. Uh, let's do W. We'll make this thing faster. Do speed plus equals zero point. Let's do zero one. Let's make it speed up relatively slowly. And then let's also make it so if they press S, they can slow down by doing minus equal. And to keep the speed from ever going negative, I'm going to add a check here and say if the speed ever gets to be less than zero, then speed equals zero. And let's make a max speed too here. So let's say if speed ever gets to be greater than, let's see, it's going 0.5 now. Let's say if it ever gets to be greater than 10, then speed equal 10. And that way we can't get this thing going so fast that it doesn't so look like anything. So here, oops. I shouldn't have put speed. I need to put ball speed. So let me fix those places where I use that. Ball speed, ball speed. All right, now we should be good. Okay, so there's the ball. I press W to speed it up. You notice it gets faster. 
and I can speed it all the way up to its maximum speed that I'm at now, and I can slow it back down again. I can slow it all the way down to where it stops. I can press R to get a new random direction, or spacebar, I mean, to get a new random direction. So I can stop it, press spacebar, speed it up again. And I can get it going really fast, get new random directions. Slow it back down again. And notice that the faster my speed, the larger these circles are that it drives in. Here, let me see if I can get a nice circle going here. There we go. But notice this is all really pretty simple though. The only thing we're doing is taking dx, dy, converting back to the new angle and speed if there's ever a collision. And one final thing we might add to this is let's make it so that there's a little bit of friction that slows this thing down as it moves. And let's make it so it slows down even more whenever it hits the wall. So how do we do that? How do we have some loss of energy when we do a collision? Well, the one of the things that I'm going to do is we already have the code here that says, hey, if this thing collided, here's where we compute the new speed and angle. Well, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to say lose some energy in a collision. So ball speed equal. Now, how could I reduce the speed? Well, I can say ball speed times, and let's say it loses 10% of its energy. So if we multiplied by 0.9, that would reduce that. And notice another thing we could do here, instead of writing it out like that, we can just say times equal, oops, times equal 0 0.9. So we've lost 10% of our energy in a collision. Now let's look at that in action here. So you all know, you notice when it hits the wall, it's, here, let me make it go fast. And you notice every time it hits a wall, it's going to get a little bit slower and a little bit slower. Notice it's slowing down. So it's kind of like a high bouncer giving up some of its energy to the collision. And eventually it'll go really, really slow. But let's make it more like a pool table. So it's going to lose some energy while it's rolling too. So not only does it lose energy due to friction when it bounces, but it also loses energy when it's rolling. And that's just, that's not going to be when it collides, that's going to be every time. So maybe after this, we say, lose energy due to friction. So that's going to be the same concept though. We just need to lower the speed a little bit. So here, ball speed, no times equal. Now we probably don't want to do 0 0.9 because it's going to come to a stop really fast. Here, let's watch that and ha watch that happen. <laughs> so even when I try to accelerate it, it stops really fast because the frame rate is pretty high. It's losing that very quickly. So let's make this so that this, uh, we multiply it by, by 0.99 and see what that is. We're losing just 1% of the speed as the thing rolls. Now notice it's still coming to a stop pretty quickly. So the friction is very high right now. So let's make it a little bit uh, less. Let's do 0.999. Let's see what that does. So now we're losing just a tenth of a percent of the speed over time. So you notice it kind of comes to a stop, but I can speed it back up again and it'll slowly come to a stop again. Let me move that all on the screen here. Give it some energy, goes faster and comes to a stop. Okay, and notice that we can change the friction factor to make it less or more. We can change how much energy is lost in the collision to make it less or more. And really, the, these few lines of code that we added here with being able to convert from dx and dy back to a speed and angle, or being able to take the speed and the angle and convert to a dx and dy to convert to those displacements, really powerful stuff. And next class, we're going to look at this a little more, and we're going to add the ability to have things like forces uh, that are imparted upon the uh, objects in our game world. So for example, we can have 
uh, gravity pulling the things down toward the bottom. Or we might have uh, you click with a mouse and it creates an explosion that blows something away from that point. And so we're going to be looking at those uh, coming up here. But before we do that, we're going to look at another, a, a few other uses for sine and cosine. Uh, for drawing things on the screen uh, that are more interesting shapes. Uh, so what I would encourage you to do is try to code this up. Um, make sure that you uh, look at what's happening here, see if you can get this to work. And the main thing I want you to understand is not just copy and paste the code uh, to get this to work. And notice that here, let me clean this code up a little bit. Notice that this isn't a whole lot of code here to do what we just did, but we now have something that seems much more uh, realistic as far as the physics are concerned. But you'll notice that really it was four lines of code to do the math that we needed to do uh, to do that. So notice most of this was the same as what we had last time. But now in this case, here's the dx and dy. And down here, we're using the, the dx and dy now that they've been changed to convert the angle or get the angle and the speed that results from that uh, after the collision and then lose some energy in the process and then lose some energy due to friction. And then our rendering is the same as it was. So this is actually relatively simple, uh, not very much code here, but we can we have something that now looks much more complex as far as this thing moving and slowing down. Again, think of this like a pool table. You impart energy to the ball and then it will eventually bounce off the rails and come to a stop. And we could play with those factors to make it have less friction like an air hockey table or more friction like a, a soccer ball rolling on grass or um, something in like a rolling a bocce ball in a sand pit uh, field, whatever. We could play around with the friction factors to make that. And we could even make uh, if we wanted to, we can make different parts of the field, like here's an ice part where things slide and then they slow down. Here's a part where they, uh, um, the friction is higher, like a sand trap or a golf ball on a golf course. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff we could do to make this more realistic, and we're going to look at some of that later on. All right, so let's switch back to the uh, slides for a second here. Okay, so we wrote the code. We basically, when the ball hit a vertical wall, we inverted dx. When it hit a horizontal wall, we inverted dy. And then after we did the inversion uh, of the dx and or dy, we computed the resulting speed and angle using arctangent 2 and the Pythagorean theorem. So we wrote all that up. So moving on now uh, in this, that's all uh, that we're going to do today. I do want you to take a look at assignment 6 because that's going to be posted today as well. And assignment six, uh, you get to use that stuff we just did uh, as part of the game. Uh, let me quickly describe what you're doing for assignment six. Basically, you're going to have a balloon that moves around on the screen, bounces off the walls. Sounds pretty familiar. But I want that balloon, uh, as it moves around on the screen and bounces off the walls, I want that to be uh, done using an image file rather than just a circle like we had here. So you're going to have to figure out how to render that and how to observe the edges of that. And then the other thing, you're going to have a mouse pointer that looks like a pin, and you're going to pop the balloon. When the balloon pops, it creates a new balloon somewhere else. So you're going to use the mouse to play this game. It's going to have a countdown like the last one did, uh, where you have a certain amount of time to pop as many balloons as possible. So think about this as kind of like a mouse training program, where you pop as many balloons as you can. So it's a relatively simple game mechanic, but it's going to be... Uh, and a chance for you to use the stuff we just learned about uh, here with the displacements from the angle and the speed, bouncing off the walls, converting back the other way. And really, you have most of the code you need in what I already posted. Clean it up a little bit, uh, add some graphics to it, add the mouse code to it. So I want you to try to get that working. Now, that's really all we're going to do today. So look at assignment six, get started on that. And next class, we're going to do a little bit more stuff with uh, sine and cosine, um, and I'm going to show you some additional code uh, for what you can do with that, but we're going to stop there for now. Everybody stay safe, wear a mask, oh, and uh, since it's election season, 
get out and vote. Uh, really, that's an important thing. Um, I know it's a cliche to say it's uh, one of the most, uh, this election is very important, but I, I really strongly agree. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of uh, science and reason and uh, rationality uh, on the line in this particular election. So I don't really care who you vote for. Well, I kind of do. I'd rather you voted for rationality and reasonableness. And, uh, but it's, uh, you, you're adults, make your own decisions, but do get out and exercise your right to vote. Uh, it's important, and it's important to kind of shape the world in the future uh, that you want to see uh, at some point. So let your voice be heard. Get out and vote. Encourage other people to do so as well. All right, that's it for today. Everybody stay safe. Wear a mask. Uh, make sure to, uh, if you have questions to let me know and I'll be happy to come in and answer them. Uh, but get started on that lab if you can recreate the stuff we did in the, uh, the lecture today. That's the probably the best starting point you can have for, uh, starting that lab and let me know if you have problems. I'll be here.